heaven bound. None of us would be able to worship Him, pray to Him, seek Him. None of that would be possible apart from the grace of God. Undeserved. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Thank you, Mike. Amen. Love that song and love the spirit of what you sing it because I know you know what you're singing about. It. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 21. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 21. Peter is preaching the first message of the New Testament church. They had just been filled with the Holy Spirit and with power. They burst out of the room in which they were at. The crowd gathered around wondering what was happening. And Peter, like any good preacher, when he sees a crowd, he starts preaching. And he starts explaining what is going on here. In the midst of this message, he makes this very important statement. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. I like that. It's all inclusive, isn't it? It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what your economic status is. It doesn't matter what your race or nationality is. It doesn't matter what you have done in the past. All that. None of that matters. Everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, who puts their faith in Jesus Christ and calls upon Him for salvation, everyone is saved who does that. I want to key in this morning from this particular verse on one word. That word being the word saved. Saved. A few years ago, Gretchen and I were on another little mini vacation, as we tend to take from time to time, and on the Sunday morning, we visited a, a particular church, and it was a large church. Uh, I would guess they uh, ran around 1,500 or so from the size of the building and all of that. And so we ran a large church, contemporary worship service, which was fine. And uh, the pastor, uh, when he got up to preach, as part of his message, he interviewed uh, four different individuals or couples within uh, the church. And they had on the platform a couch and two overstuffed chairs, kind of a tonight show setup. And as he was interviewing them, he was asking them about their spiritual journey, asking them about how they got to be where they were at in the church, and what were the circumstances that brought them there. And uh, they begin to describe, each one, uh, how in their life this happened, that happened. And, and one thing I noticed in all of these interviews was that one particular phrase kept coming up over and over and over again. The pastor mentioned it several times. Those he were interviewing also mentioned it, describing uh, how they got to where they were at. And that particular phrase was... Falling in love with Jesus. That was the term that seemed to be apropos within that church. Falling in love with Jesus. And so he would ask him something to effect. Well, tell us, how did you fall in love with Jesus? How did you end up falling in love with Jesus? And in their answers, they would mention falling in love with Jesus. And every testimony kind of had the same vibe to it. Of course, the details different, but all of them kind of went this way. Well, I, I was at a point in my life where I had a need, and uh, you know, I got divorced, or uh, I lost my job, or something happened with me physically, and I realized I had this need in my life, and so I came, and started coming to church, and and uh, there at church, uh, I uh, learned how much God loved me, and uh, people were so friendly and welcoming. And, really liked it here. I just started coming. I learned about Jesus and I fell in love with Jesus. And, you know, as I'm sitting there listening to them speak, and I know I sound like somebody stuck in the past, an old dinosaur who just hold on to dusty relics of bygone era, but it bothered me a little bit what they were saying or how they were describing because the one thing they never mentioned, any of them, in all of 
this was the crisis moment of salvation. How they came to know Jesus Christ at a moment in time as their Lord and Savior. It was all described as a process of just, oh, I came to church, I you heard the messages, I learned how much God loved me, and over time, and this is kind of how it sounded, over time I just learned to fall in love with Jesus. And no one ever mentioned about getting saved. Now, I was only there one Sunday, and it may be a perfectly fine church that does preach the gospel. I'm, not, I'm just telling you, for my impression at that moment, that's what it was. That's why I like to use biblical terms. You know, it's a term that you don't hear a lot in the modern church world. It's a term that, uh, that many in our culture avoid. And that is the biblical term to describe coming to Christ. And that is the term being saved. That's the biblical term. Now, do you fall in love with Jesus? Of course you do. But that's the result of being saved, not the entryway. That's not how you get saved. We love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. And so we fall in love with Jesus. And of course, love central to the Christian walk. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. Love our neighbor as ourselves. That's what it means to be a Christian. To live that type of love. But that's not the entryway. We don't just morph into it. There is a moment in time in which we are saved. And that's what was missing from all of that. And that's, what's, that's a term that's missing from a lot in our modern church world. I like the term saved because, first of all, it's biblical. It's how the Bible describes it. The word saved or saves or save or salvation is mentioned almost a hundred times in the New Testament alone. Do you remember when the angels made their proclamation to the shepherds on the night that Jesus Christ was born? They did not say, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, someone that you'll learn to fall in love with. They said, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. God in the Old Testament is also, in many, many places, presented as Savior, salvation, mighty to save. As a matter of fact, the very term salvation carries with it the idea of being saved. Now I mention all this because we are beginning a five-part series of messages I've entitled, Words That Matter. Because I believe in our modern culture and in the modern church world, there are some biblical terms that have fallen by the wayside that you don't hear a whole lot about but, that, but are very important. <coughs> and so we're going to look at one word a week. And as you can imagine, the word this week is the word saved. Because the Bible teaches that that's what it means to become a Christian. We are saved. Acts 2.21 And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved. Matthew 1, 21. She will give birth to a son. The angel is telling Joseph when he's contemplating whether or not to wed Mary after he finds out she's, uh, she has child. The angel tells him she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Romans 10, 9. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. <coughs> And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Just three parts, or three places of almost 100 you find in the Old Testament in which this term, saved, or one of its derivatives, is used. Now to be saved implies that I need saved from something. And it also implies my inability to save myself. Plus it implies the sufficiency of the one who does the saving. All of that's implied in the term saved. And in this world where being a Christian is presented in so many different ways, what does it mean to be a Christian? You'll hear 101 different answers. I believe that it is important that we understand that to be a Christian means that we are saved. 
And we understand what that term means. And there's twofold uh, application here. Say, why, why should I care? Why should I keep listening? Not start thinking about lunch here. Twofold application. We as Christians, first of all, need to understand what a great salvation God has given us so that we will not neglect it. Too many Christians neglect their salvation, take God for granted because they don't contemplate and we need reminded of what this great salvation is, what God has saved us from, and why we need as Christians to hold on to it like the dearest thing we have. And then secondly, obviously if there's anyone here today who has not experienced this salvation, maybe you've grown up in the church, and maybe you're sitting here today and you're, you're religious, but you never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never truly been born again in the way I'm going to describe here. Then it's my hope and prayer that you will not leave here in that same condition. But this will be your day of salvation. So let's look at this. What are we saved from? When Christ saves us, what's that talking about? Let me list three things. First of all, we are saved from the guilt and the stain of sin. Ephesians 1.7 brings us out. In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of God's grace. Let me ask you a question, those of you. Uh, first of all, how many here do laundry? Let me see your hand. Girl. Okay, just about all of you. Maybe some men didn't raise their hand. Well, for those of you who do laundry, have you ever gotten a stain in something that you could not get out? I do that all the time. Before I like to go to Kohl's to their clearance rack, and I pay $5 or less for a shirt because I'm always ruining shirts. And it would kill me if I ruined a shirt I paid, you know, $30 for. Paid $4 for it, well, not such a big deal, I guess. Well, there's a, uh, not an invention, a product, that's the word I wanted to use, that Gretchen carries around with her all the time. Maybe some of you have it. It's called Tied to Go. And I think she carries it around for me. <laughs> and uh, what that is, if you're out and about, and you notice you have a stain on your shirt or on your pants and you don't want to walk around with a stain, you can take this product and you can rub it right on that stain and it miraculously disappears. And it works pretty well on most stains. But the thing is, it doesn't work on all the stains. Because some stains, and those of you who do laundry understand, some stains you just can't get out. And so for those... Uh, articles of clothing that have that sort of stain on it. You either just wear it as is, or you throw the garment away. Say, so what in the world has this got to do with anything? <laughs> Sin stains the life before God. There is a, a stain of sin on the life of a person before God. It stains the soul. They are acts which cannot be undone. Words that cannot be unsaid. <coughs> Attitudes which you cannot change yourself. We stand before God and man with a life stained with the wretched, the vile, the abhorrent, the ungodly. And like the lepers of old time, all we can honestly say about ourselves in the heart, in the sight of a holy God, is the heart-wrenching cry of unclean, unclean, I'm stained, I'm sinful, I'm guilty. That's the life without Jesus. Liar, luster, hater, gospel, uh, traitor. You fill in the blank. Sin stains the life. And sin like scarlet seeps into every crevice of our soul. And the thing about it is, 
no time to go is going to get it out. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, you and I can ever do to remove the stain of sin from our life. Nothing you can do. No good work can take it away. No religious ritual can make us pure. All the resolutions and promises and turning over new leaves cannot take away the stain of sin. And I want you to get the picture here. We're trying to understand what it means to be saved. Here we stand, having done wrong, thought wrong, wrong attitudes, said wrong. It, we are guilty as charged. Standing before an all holy, pure God who cannot look upon, condone sin in any way, shape, or form. And here we stand before a holy God in the stinking, solid rags of our sin. That's not a good place to be. And yet, here comes Jesus. And he saves us from being in that kind of state. He saves us by forgiving our sin through His sacrifice He made for us on the cross. He saves us. And this morning I stand before God no longer guilty but forgiven. I stand before God no longer in all the acts of unrighteousness but I stand before God clothed in the righteousness of Christ cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ he saved me from that terrible state of standing before God in the stain of my sin because he has forgiven me we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sin he saves us no wonder the hymn writer wrote the cleansing stream. I see, I see. I plunge and oh, it cleanses me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanses me. It cleanses me, yes, it cleanses me. And every one of us that are redeemed can say the same thing. We are saved from the guilt and stain of our sins. That's the salvation you have. Apart from Jesus, you are stained and there is not a thing you can do about it. But Jesus saves us from the guilt and stain of sin. Let's look at another one. Jesus saves us from the power of sin. This is the glorious message of Romans chapter number 6. And the message is simple. I don't have to keep sinning. I don't have to be bound by the things that bring destruction in my life. The things that destroy my marriage. The things that warp my mind. I don't have to be bound by lust and greed and hate and selfishness. Christ freed me from all the things that bring sorrow and heartache. And all, the, all the sin that brings bondage. As a Christian, Christ breaks the power of sin in our life. So not only am I cleansed before God and given a positional righteousness, if you will, He also changes my heart and my nature and He breaks the power of sin over my life so that I can actually live a life that's, not, that's pleasing to God, but not only that, is edifying to me. He breaks the power of sin. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 bears this out. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? You know, that's the attitude of a lot of people. Well, you know, no one's perfect and I just keep going doing what I'm doing and Grace covers it all. I said that prayer when I was 10 years old, and grace covers it all. And so, that's not the Christian life that Jesus died to give you, where you just keep bound by these things. No, the answer to that is by no means. Talk about what Jesus saves us from. What, is it, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does Jesus save us from? We're not to keep on sinning. And that means to live a life of 
sin. We're not just to just have sin have dominion over us. No. By no means. The King James Version puts it this way. God forbid. That's not the Christian life. We died to sin. When Jesus Christ saved me, I died in that old way of life. How in the world can I live in it any longer? And then he goes on to say in verse 6, where we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. Don't have time to break that down, but let's look at the last part of verse 6. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. That means the Christian life is not a life lived in sin. It's not a life of just perpetual sinning. Sin having to... No, Christ saves us from the dominion of sin. From the power of sin. And how does he do that? By changing us. From the inside out. He puts a new nature in us. A new heart. He writes his law on our heart. Our desires are changed. Our attitudes are changed. And then He places His Spirit inside of us to empower us to live the way we now want to live as Christians. Let me give you an example from my own life. And when, uh, when I was younger, my mother had a friend. and Her friend had three daughters. The oldest daughter's name was Donna. Donna and I did not get along at all. I mean, I literally despised her. Every time we got together, we, it was like oil and water. I did not like her. I did not like her. I could not stand to be around her. She just rubbed me the wrong way. Just, that's how I felt about her. And yet, my mom and this lady were friends, so we were always together with this Donna. My mom was always throwing us together. They even went to our same church. You can believe that. They didn't even find their own church to go to. <laughs> so every time at church, there was Donna. And I'm telling you, I did not like her at all. I despised her. Well, you've heard me say my testimony before. One Sunday evening at the Glen Road Church of the Nazarene under the ministry of Reverend Terry Kidd, the pastor at the time, on a Sunday evening, he preached on something, I have no idea what, but at some point in the message, as an eight-year-old child, something clicked in my mind. For the first time in my life, I really, really understood, got the revelation that I was a sinner. I had sinned. I had done wrong in the sight of God. But Jesus died so I could be forgiven of my sin. In that simple truth, even though I've been taught that, I grew up in the church of the Nazarene my whole life. And even before that point in time, I would say prayers as a child, you know, as children do. And all that laid the groundwork for this moment. So don't ever say that that's not important when a four-year-old or five-year-old says those prayers. It all laid the groundwork to this. Suddenly, at eight years of age, on that Sunday night, God just gave me that revelation, and I, and I just understood it like I'd never done before. And I felt the Lord tell me to go forward and receive Christ as Savior. And I did on that Sunday evening. And let me tell you something. When Jesus Christ came into my heart, to use the terminology when I was growing up, when I gave my life to Christ, no one had to tell me, oh, you're saved now, you're a Christian now, your sins are... No one had to tell me that. I knew it. I knew it beyond a shadow of doubt as an eight-year-old child. I didn't understand all the theological implications of it, of course, uh, but I knew something had changed on the inside of me. And the proof in the pudding, at least immediately, right after church, there's Don. Before church, we had been fighting. Before church, I couldn't stand even to look at her. She, I would just get instantly mad when I saw her. And there Donna came, and she tried to pick a fight with her. I would have none of it. 
There was a love in my heart for her. What happened there? The power of sin was broken. That's what happened. There was a change on the inside of me that I could have never done myself. My parents could have told me, you need to treat Donna nice, and I could have gritted my teeth and tried to get along with her. But what God did is He came in me and He broke the power of sin in my life. Now, that doesn't mean I never struggled with anything at all. I don't want to paint that picture. <laughs> Just because you get born again and the power of sin is broken doesn't mean you never struggle with temptation. But it does mean we are now equipped to learn to walk in the victory Jesus died to give us. It does mean we now have a heart change. We have our desires changed. The Holy Spirit is in us. And we learn to rest in the finished work of Christ. And it does mean that the dominion of sin over my life has been broken through this born again experience. And then after that, when I got entirely sanctified, and of course, before and after that, there's spiritual growth. And degree by degree, moment by moment, I become more and more like Jesus. But the thing is, the power of sin is broken in our life. We are saved from that dominion of sin. We are never, never the same again once Jesus Christ comes into our heart and life. The power of sin is broken. Talk about what this word saved means. I am saved from the guilt and stain of sin. I am saved from the power and dominion and grip that sin had on my life. And then lastly, Jesus saves from the penalty of sin. Sin carries with it a penalty. And that penalty is death. The wages of sin is death. Now we're going to look more at this in depth in the coming weeks. One week we'll look at the word sin and what that means and what that entails. Another week we're going to look at the word eternal. There's eternal aspect to the gospel that we need to keep ever in mind. But sufficient to say today that not only when Jesus Christ saved me, not only did He change my standing before God by saving me from the guilt and the stain of sin, not only did He change my heart before God by saving me from the power of sin, He also saved me from the destiny of a sin-filled life, from hell. He changed my destiny. Every one of us here. You know, we just sang earlier, uh, Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. We did not have that testimony before Jesus. Every one of us was bound for hell. That's, that's the destiny of everyone outside of Christ. And that is why it's imperative, by the way, church, that we take seriously our work for the gospel's sake. Because we're not just talking about getting people here for church. And we're not just talking about entertaining kids. And we're not just talking about helping people feel a little better. Helping them with the things of life. There is an eternal destiny at stake. I was bound for hell. And I deserved hell as a guilty sinner before God. But then Jesus came. And he saved me from that destiny. And today I can sing blessed assurance Jesus is mine. I can sing that because Jesus Christ saved me from a devil's hell. He saved me from being condemned before God. The wages of sin, Romans 6.23 says, is death. That death entails spiritual death, which is in the here and now. Sin separates me from God. He's the only source of life. Apart from God, I am spiritually dead. But it also entails the eternal death, the second death. That is eternal separation from God. That's hell. 
Whatever you may think theologically, hell might entail, one thing we know, it's a place where God is not. It is a place where you are eternally separated from Him, and there is absolutely not one iota hope of it ever getting any better. That was my sentence, death. That was my punishment. That was the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. He saved me from hell. Are you happy about that? Yeah. You think about that much. You're heaven bound. You have the assurance of eternal life through your faith in Jesus Christ. He has saved you. Saved you from the guilt and stain of your sinful actions and attitudes and your sinful heart before God. Saved you from the power of sin. Saved you from a, a destiny in hell, the penalty of sin. Oh, what a Savior we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. He saved us. Words do matter. And the word saved is an important word. Saved from the guilt of sin. Saved from the power of sin. Saved from the penalty of sin. And as I wrap this up, a question comes to my mind. Why has this word fallen by the wayside? in so many churches. What's wrong with the word saved? Why in so many churches you'll never hear that term used? Well, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons people would give. Some would say that the post-Christian world doesn't understand what saved means and so we should avoid using it, but I would just counter that and say, well, tell them what it means. <laughs> I didn't understand it until so someone explained it to me. Of course, you're not going to understand what it means unless you explain it. It's a biblical word. And then some churches in a mad pursuit to be relevant or hip or to follow the latest fad in church growth, you know, just banning all the biblical terms. But I think there's even a deeper reason. The world doesn't like this term, and much of the church avoids it. Is that the term saved does nothing to exalt me. Right? The term saved just shows me as I really am. A helpless, guilty, damned sinner. <laughs> deserving of nothing but the wrath of God. And an absolute need of God's salvation. That doesn't do a whole lot for the ego. We like to think of ourselves as being not all that bad. Pretty nice Joe. I'm a good moral person. I'm a kind person. I helped someone change their tire a week ago. Or I gave a little money to this. And so I'm not all that bad. And so the term saved goes by the wayside. And it also pinpoints the real issue of life. And we'll look at this more next week. With that being of sin. I need saved from sin. Sin is the issue. It's not who my parents are. It's not how I was raised. It's not what environment I... All those things contribute to some of our issues and woes. But the heart of the issue, the real heart of man's problem is sin. And sin bears that to mind. And so it just kind of is tossed by the wayside because the term saved exposes the sin problem, exposes our helplessness, and it exposes our rebellious hearts who don't want to give up certain things and strikes at our sinful pride who wants to think of ourselves better than what we really are. But the good news is, for those who accept God's revelation, that we are sinners in need of Christ and accept the atoning work of Christ on their behalf, the good news is, we are saved. Saved. Forgiven and cleansed. A heart changed and continually being changed. And heaven bound. 
everyone, as Peter said, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. My question to you is, have you? And Diane, would you be able to make your way to the piano? We're not going to take long.